The medical use of the psychedelic drug Ibogaine continues to be a dynamic hot topic. Small studies are suggesting promising benefits in even more conditions. Safety risks and dubious practices at Ibogaine clinics are popping up and uncertainty about regulations is at an all-time high. A related event we previously discussed was the rejection of an approval application for MDMA. Some of the reasons against it were pretty solid, but this rejection dampened expectations for the entire field. In another previous video, we learned how ibogaine acts in the body, what benefits investigators are starting to see in the clinic, and how ibogaine is made in the professional lab. We also covered how next-generation molecules like the non-hallucinogenic tabernantalog might address ibogaine's safety shortcomings. Just recently, Olson and co-workers disclosed another interesting analog and the most efficient synthesis of ibogaine to date. Though you might have a new definition of efficient at the end of this video. We'll discuss basic and advanced organic chemistry as well as biology. So this should be interesting if you're a student or a general science enthusiast. So we learned that ibogaine and its simpler cousin ibogamine lacking the aromatic methoxy group were first synthesized by Büchi in the 1960s. Since then, there have been more syntheses than you can count. But most of them took more than a dozen steps and typically yield less than 5-10% to of final product. Currently, ibogaine is primarily obtained semi-synthetically from a carboxylated cousin in the iboga family in low yield. Synthetic chemistry isn't really sustainable per se, but very efficient approaches might be the way to access large quantities of ibogaine and related analogs for clinical purposes. Instead of spoiling all the fun with the retro synthesis, let's cut to the chase and jump straight into this newest and shortest approach. We start our journey with the synthesis of a dihydropyridine derivative through acylation of pyridine followed by reduction. This intermediate is not stable as it will happily oxidize and rearrange to the pyridinium to restore its aromaticity. Thus, it's quickly used in the next step without any purification. Here's where you can test your predictive abilities. What reaction might occur with this cyclopropyl enone? As we've seen in prior syntheses, this is the method of making the isonuclidine ring of ibogaine with a diels alder reaction. We have an electron poor alkene and an activated diene. So the first question is how these might link up. This can be answered by simply considering resonance structures, telling us where the diene is most nucleophilic and where the dienophile is most electrophilic. Given the carbonyl group, we also expect preference for the endo addition where the pi system of the carbonyl is on the same side as the internal carbons of the diene. In this reaction, this leads to a rough 2 to 1 ratio of endo to exo. There are several interesting points to note. First, degassing at minus 78 degrees proved critical given the mentioned instability of the dihydropyridine. Another one is that the reaction is done neat with the oily enone acting as the solvent. We easily explained the endo preference, but you will notice that the chemists added methoxide as well. This base-catalyzed epimerization converts the endo-enriched product to a one-to-one -one mixture of endo and exo. If you're keeping ibogaine structure in mind, you'll realize that this was done because the exo isomer is the one we're actually interested in. More on this later. The next reaction nicely used the new double bond to introduce a side chain, as we need an ethyl group in ibogaine. So how does this one work? If you've seen similar reactions, you might suggest a hydrogen atom transfer to give a carbon radical that adds to the alkene. Quenching the radical and hydrolyzing the ester should give our product. This is almost correct, but does not explain the high diastereoselectivity. An important unwritten rule in organic chemistry is to never forget the groups that you are abbreviating. The preferred phase for addition is also where our CBZ protecting group is located. Is this just a coincidence? Our simple first explanation does not consider the fact that the carbon radical will actually still closely associate with the iron catalyst. Considering the two possible configurations of this metalloradical, 
it's not crazy to assume that the EXO is more stabilized by coordination to the CBZ carbamate. The radical will create the new CC bond on that same side, so this explains our diastereoselectivity. By the way, if you want to get better at chemistry, check out the practice problems posted on my website. These contain easy to difficult questions related to our video topics and other nice examples to help you improve your skills and knowledge. Back to our radical addition. We unfortunately have to pay for the high diastereoselectivity with an additional step. The carbonyl's purpose was just to ensure an efficient coupling, so we need to get rid of it through decarboxylation. The more you look at the experimentals of the reaction, the crazier it gets. But first, we should understand the basics of the mechanism. At the core, it's simply an oxidation of the carboxylate, followed by decarboxylation and hydrogen abstraction. The photocatalysis is a fancy way of avoiding metals, instead using an organic acridinium catalyst as the initial oxidant. Let's unpack this. First of all, we need a base to generate the carboxylate. The system was particularly picky as cesium counterines proved essential. As you can see here, sodium or potassium salts didn't really convert. One explanation is that the carboxylate has weaker ionic binding with cesium, increasing its propensity to get oxidized by the photocatalyst to kick off the decarboxylation. However, too much cesium hydroxide isn't great either, because using more than one equivalent starts to destroy the catalyst. Such catalyst decomposition plagued the reaction nevertheless, but there was an interesting workaround they found. By adding the catalyst in two portions over two 24-hour intervals, conversion and yield were boosted. Another random finding was that the reaction performed best in a biphasic 4 to 1 mixture of DCM and water. Other solvents were again clearly worse. So we have a sensitive photocatalyst, strange counter ion effects and a biphasic mixture. The only other thing we need to complete it is a random vessel effect. It turned out that reaction tubes with just the right diameter to volume ratio worked much better than others. Here's another lesson. Your lab documentation should be top notch. If you scale up or simply just try to repeat such exotic reactions, you can easily run into a scenario where a reaction quote unquote stops working. I've definitely seen this and if you experienced this yourself in the lab, you can entertain us with your story in the comments. Reflecting on the challenges of the last two steps, you might want to directly include the ethyl group in the pyridine diene. The issue here is the stereoselectivity of the required reduction. All attempted methods delivered the hydrogen from the bottom phase, giving the endomethyl product. This is cool if you want to synthesize the epi iboga isomers to tick off more natural products of your bingo card, but for the real deal, it doesn't help. So we really do have to stick with this approach. The next obstacle was the seven-membered ring. This is where you might feel clever again, assuming that deprotection of the amine releases a nucleophile that will gladly open up the cyclopropyl homo Michael acceptor. Well, Sir Jack Baldwin would like to have a word with you because this seven endo tet cyclization goes against his guidelines. The hypothesis was that Lewis acids might help overcome the kinetic disfavoring, but the cyclopropane proved resilient. It's pretty amazing that the cyclopropane does not want to get rid of its strain energy intramolecularly even with Lewis acid activation at 90 degrees. If you can't take a big step, you should try taking multiple smaller ones. Hydrogen bromide turned out to save the day because this deprotected the CBZ group and also opened up the cyclopropane. So the softer nucleophile bromide works much better even if the reaction is intermolecular now. In this system, the cyclization now occurs using base and heat. Remember that we had a one-to-one -one mixture of endo and exo epimers? Only the exo epimer is reactive. So I wondered if the weak base is sufficient to epimerize and convert less reactive endoepimer to exo as it is consumed. They didn't call this out explicitly, but note that they isolated this product in similar yield as a mixture of epimers with an undisclosed ratio. 
If this is close to a 1 to 1 ratio, then some epimerization must have been going on. In any case, this is another nice lesson for us. Reactions don't always go in the direction we want them to. It really looks like the cyclopropane isn't friends with the amine and just wants to be left alone. There are some parallels to the gram scale synthesis of ibogamine, so ibogaine without the methoxy group, that we discussed previously. In this work, deprotection and intramolecular nitrogen alkylation were also used to create the seven membered ring, but just the other way around. To make up for the previous challenges, our last step is simple. This is a standard Fischer indole synthesis, a reaction often employed to make iboga and other alkaloids. This delivers racemic ibogaine in just seven steps, making it the shortest approach yet. Unfortunately, the yield drops by one third when running it on one and a half gram scale, so it's not amazingly scalable. You can probably debate the impact level of this work and whether the synthesis is actually efficient in absolute terms from a molecular and experimental perspective. But it's the most efficient one we have and it starts from cheap pyridine, so it has a few things going for it. A cool feature of the Fischer indole synthesis is that by changing the substitution of the aryl hydrazine, different analogues of ibogaine can be accessed. They found something interesting here, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Ibogaine only occurs as the minus enantiomer in nature, but the prior synthesis gave a racemic mixture of both enantiomers. To get just a natural or unnatural enantiomer, you could try to separate them with crystallization or instead inject an enantioselective step in the synthesis. They tried various ways, which you can check out in the supporting information of the paper. The final solution involved attaching an Evans oxazolidinone to the dienophile to make the Diels Alder reaction asymmetric. If you pay attention to detail, you'll notice that the nitrogen had to be protected with a phenyl carbamate. In the asymmetric variant, our initial CBZ group suddenly gave a much lower yield and the selectivity was bad. Probably the Lewis acid partially deprotects the CBZ group which lowers the yield and the conformational flexibility from the additional CH2 group decreases the selectivity of the addition. The rest of the approach is similar, though you have to remove the chiral auxiliary and introduce the cyclopropyl group. Molecules shouldn't be just made for the sole purpose of making them, so the next logical question is whether the unnatural enantiomer behaves differently than the natural mirror image. This biological testing also included two other molecules. The first one is noribogaine, the longer acting main metabolite of ibogaine formed by demethylation. It has a much longer half-life in the body and higher potency at certain receptors, so it's actually the more active form in vivo. Among many other subsequent metabolic steps, nor ibogaine faces glucuronidation, which leverages the free hydroxyl group to attach a highly polar sugar that boosts drug clearance out of the body. The second molecule added to the biological testing is an unnatural mimic of nor ibogaine. Instead of a free hydroxyl group, it features a fluoride and it can be made by simply taking a different starting material for the Fischer indole synthesis. You'll also realize that it's metabolically more stable than nor ibogaine because it doesn't feature the free hydroxyl group. So, how do these molecules compare? The first biological test looked at effects on neurons cultured from the brain of rat embryos. Dendritic spines are tiny protrusions on the neuron and the critical contact points between different neurons to transmit information. It's well known that ibogaine and nor ibogaine increase the density of dendritic spines, which is one of the reasons why these compounds might have benefits for brain plasticity, so the brain's ability to quote unquote adapt and reorganize. A similar, potentially weaker effect was observed with the fluoro analog, meaning so far it's not really special. In contrast, the unnatural plus ibogaine did not increase spine density. This showed for the first time that this effect of ibogaine also comes from binding to another chiral entity, most likely a receptor. We don't know which target it is, but given the increased interest in ibogaine-like compounds, it's probably only a matter of time until we do. 
The second test relates to a much better known ability of ibogaine, the modulation of the serotonin transporter. The CERT recycles serotonin in presynaptic neurons and helps regulate the balance of the concentration of this important neurotransmitter. The infamous class of SSRI antidepressants act here, competitively blocking the binding of serotonin and thereby extending its neurotransmitter action. You'll notice ibogaine and noribogaine are basically serotonin decorated with alkyl groups. This makes them much bulkier and explains why they don't bind at CERT like normal substrates like serotonin. Instead they bind in another way to the inward open conformation or over two steps help move the CERT from the outward open to the inward open conformation. Long story short, this differentiated binding could be behind ibogaine's unique psychoactive effects with lower abuse or addictive potential compared to other CERT modulators which bind differently. In their second biological test, the researchers looked at CERT inhibition not only in terms of inhibition of uptake, but also the other way around in terms of efflux of radio-labeled serotonin. From the data, we see that as expected, ibogaine and noribogaine partially inhibit serotonin uptake, with noribogaine being roughly 20-fold more potent. The fluorinated analog isn't too shabby either, but the unnatural ibogaine enantiomer was again pretty useless. This makes a lot of sense given the chirality of CERT. The big difference was seen when looking at the release of serotonin by these cells, where the fluoro compound showed the strongest effect. Comparing the ratios of uptake inhibition and release stimulation gives us an interesting indication. For example, ibogaine's CERT inhibition was 5 times higher than its release of serotonin. The ratio flips for MDMA, which is three times more potent as an efflux inducer, and our fluoro compound has a massive 20x ratio. This is a unique activity profile, as the compound strongly releases serotonin and could also induce brain plasticity, as we saw in the first experiment. In addition to activity, its metabolic stability might also give a compelling pharmacokinetic profile should it be turned into a drug. However, other characterizations of the compound have not been disclosed yet. On the safety side, it would be interesting to see how it inhibits HERC and how it performs in cardiac arrhythmia risk assays. The Achilles heel of natural ibogaine. In the last year, scientists also published OXA iboga alkaloids, which hold the same promise of better safety. I think we're gathering enough shots on goal, so resources should be deployed towards diligent preclinical investigations rather than creating more analogs just to showcase chemistry or a slightly more efficient synthesis. That's it for this video. I had intended to only create a short one, but somehow I always end up adding more explanations and tangents. Still, I hope you liked it and learned something new. Thanks for watching and a big thanks to all my channel supporters. I'll see you soon in our next video.